This is the Capital Rundown. People all around the world will say, gosh, I, I used to think that the U.S. was a safe place to invest, but maybe not. Keep our kids and communities safe. We need to take these common sense actions to reduce gun violence. I mean, now we're up to 27 states. More than half the states have constitutional carry laws in the books. It's all straight ahead. The Capitol Rundown starts now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Siobhan Klepfer. It is Memorial Day weekend, but the president, the speaker of the house and many elected and appointed officials won't have much time to enjoy the holiday or take much time off. And that's because they're still working on a deal that would help pay the nation's bills. We have until June 5th to avoid defaulting on our debt. We'll talk about what that could mean for you in just a couple of minutes, but we're going to kick off today's episode of the Capitol Rundown with the latest from Washington. Lawmakers are essentially on call to return to Washington to vote on a compromise deal at any moment. But right now it's unclear exactly how negotiators will get there. We're less than a week away from defaulting. Washington is on edge. We should all be outraged and we should all be here. Before leaving for the holiday recess without a debt ceiling deal in sight, Democrats took to the House floor to air their frustrations. Five Republicans could join all 213 Democrats and lift the debt ceiling right now. Texas Republican Congressman Jody Arrington says Republicans already did their job by passing a plan to cut spending and raise the debt ceiling. We feel like we've done the responsible thing that we've governed, we've led. With just seven days to go before the potential deadline, pressure is mounting for President Biden and Speaker McCarthy to cut a deal both parties can get behind. I put forward a proposal that will cut spending by more than $1 trillion. Thursday, President Biden said negotiators are making progress each day, but says Democrats will not support cuts that harm the American people. Huge cuts in the number of teachers, police officers, border patrol agents. Republican Congresswoman Nancy May says she hopes Speaker McCarthy stands firm and does not scrap cost-saving measures like work requirements for welfare programs. I think there is some concern about where spending cuts will end up in this thing, but if we, if we get those, I think all will be fine. And that was Raquel Martin reporting. If America is unable to pay its bills, how would that affect our ability to pay our bills? So we asked Kyle Macon to check in with Michigan State University economics professor Charlie Ballard about what a default might mean for your pocketbook. That would say, OK, we, we agreed to make these payments, but now we're not going to make them. Other countries have defaulted on their debt before, but the U.S. is not one of them. If we fail to raise the debt ceiling, Ballard believes foreign countries could pull their money from U.S. stocks. I think lots of people all around the world will say, gosh, I, I used to think that the U.S. was a safe place to invest, but maybe not. If we fail to do something, people could see higher interest rates on credit cards and mortgages. A default would likely lead to all sorts of problems in the financial services sector. Probably more banks would fail. Bank lending would probably be severely curtailed. Unemployment would uh, probably rise and maybe rise by a lot. Ballard says the reason why this is getting so close to the deadline is because of politics. It's being used as, as a game of chicken to create a crisis to try to, for one side to try to extract concessions from the other. Currently, Republicans have proposed a 13% across the board cut on federal spending, where Democrats are asking President Biden to use the 14th Amendment to raise a limit without Republicans. Using this authority would allow the president and the United States to continue to pay its bills on time. Kyle Macon, thank you. The other big story from Washington this week is the race for president with two Republican candidates making it official. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis jumped in on Wednesday, first in a glitch plagued announcement on Twitter, followed up by an interview on Fox News. That followed South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, who went from an expected candidate to an official one on Monday. Both candidates are polling way behind former President Donald Trump, and others might still get in the race, including former Vice President Mike Pence. When we come back, we're going to talk about the other big issue defining the nation this week. Up next, we'll tell you how the gun debate is playing out in Michigan and around the country. The Capitol Rundown will be right back. Welcome back. While the debate over the debt looms large over the nation, there's another big issue playing out this week here in Michigan and across America. We're talking about guns. Nationally, the country marked the anniversary of the mass shooting at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. 
Not much has happened on the national front or in Texas since a gunman slaughtered 19 kids and two teachers in the Texas town one year ago. In fact, it's easier for 18 to 21 year olds to get a handgun in Texas now than it was before the shooting. But here in Michigan this week, Governor Gretchen Whitmer signed bills for what's known as red flag laws. They allow family members, police and mental health professionals to ask a judge to have someone's guns taken away if they pose a threat to themselves or others. The judge would then have 24 hours to decide on that request. If approved, the flag person would have a hearing within 14 days so they can make their case. Governor Whitmer says the state has seen its own tragedies in the past and with these new laws, she she believes they could have been prevented. Shooters from Oxford and MSU both showed concerning behavior beforehand. Now we have a way to confiscate weapons from people who pose a danger to themselves or others. To keep our kids and communities safe, we need to take these common sense actions to reduce gun violence. Michigan joins 20 other states that have red flag laws in place, but not everyone is happy with the red flag laws. Opponents say they create a system where the accused is guilty until proven innocent. Gun rights advocates say it's unconstitutional to take someone's firearms without a trial. Many support Republican legislation that would eliminate gun free safe zones around places like hospitals and schools and would allow anyone to carry concealed weapons even without a license. Constitutional carry is not a novel idea. It's been around for a long time. And yeah, I mean, now we're up to 27 states. More than half the states have constitutional carry laws in the books. You know, the old saying is when seconds matter, police are only minutes away. And, you know, that's what we believe is that individuals should have their right and ability to protect themselves. Commissioners in several counties across the state say not only are red flag laws unconstitutional, they're encouraging police and prosecutors not to enforce those laws. Coming up, those new gun safety measures are just one of the issues Michigan Democrats would consider a success. We'll talk to the Speaker of the Michigan House about that next and what else he's got on his agenda. Stay with us, that and more when the Capitol Rundown returns. Michigan Democrats have control of both the legislature and the governor's office for the first time in some 40 years, so they didn't waste any time once they took office in January. From gun safety to civil rights and right to work, they passed a bunch of their priorities in the first five months. So the rundown sat down with House Speaker Joe Tate, but we started by asking him about something that happened before he took office. How important redistricting was to helping his dreams come true. And at the end of the day, um, it just brought fairness uh, to um, the the redistricting process. Uh, so it took it took it out of the hands of the legislature. It brought more partisan fairness to how we drew the maps, and it made more districts more um, more even at, at, at the end of the day. So it was incredibly important, and. Um, you know, we were in part successful uh, in November because of that fairness uh, in, in the redistricting. We feel that this has been a successful start to the legislative session for us actually getting work done and actually meeting the needs of people and putting people first at the end of the day. It's been it's been moving by quickly, um, but that was something that, you know, we knew that the people expected uh, from us when they when they voted us in uh, to have this opportunity to work for them. We have, you know, as I mentioned before, put, put people first, you know, working on how are we ensuring that, you know, government is supporting the people of the state of Michigan. In addition to, as, as you mentioned that, you know, targeted tax relief, we knew we had to take care of working families and and find ways to put money back in their pockets so they could they could pay for, you know, they could pay their bills or they could pay for their kids school supplies. So that was incredibly important for us and a priority for us. And we're going to continue. As you mentioned, you know, we looked at common sense uh, gun violence prevention bills, which we were able to get across the finish line. And we want to continue you know, with some of the work that we're doing now with uh, the public safety trust fund, 
uh, that we introduced in the house as well too, to ensure that they're safe and strong communities are, across the state. In terms of what we've seen in the past, uh, for instance, we use if we do use gun violence prevention, you talk about shutting out of the being shut out of the process. You know, Democrats introduced uh, the similar bills that we we got to the governor's desk for almost a decade prior, and there wasn't a hearing, there wasn't any deliberation uh, around that. So I would. It, on policies that the majority of uh, Michiganders support. Uh, so, I mean, I would turn the question around on them and see, you know, what have they done in the past to to ensure that they're uh, creating safe and strong communities and, and actually um, getting work done. When we come back, we continue our conversation with Michigan House Speaker Joe Tate. But instead of looking back, we'll talk to him about what he's still got in store for the future. That's when the Capitol Rundown returns. Welcome back. Before the break, we spoke with Michigan House Speaker Joe Tate about what lawmakers have accomplished during their first five months with Democrats in control. But they still got 19 months left in office, so we asked him about what's still in store. So we're going to stick to our our principle of, of putting people first. We have a budget that we still um, we have to uh, complete. We've been moving along in the process. Obviously, that's a reflection of our values and, and the investments that we make across the state uh, for people. Uh, as I mentioned too before, public safety, that's going to be uh, incredibly in, important. We want to ensure that, you know, our, our um, public safety officials have the resources that they need uh, to, to ensure that there are safe and strong uh, communities or, uh, across the state. Um, and then continuing as well to, you know, what, how can we continue what the work we've done around uh, supporting working families and, and making sure that, you know, um, we are providing, we are providing that and, and maybe going further too with some of the tax relief um, items that, that, that we've already gotten across the finish line. So there's much more work to do. More, much more work to, to be done and uh, really excited about what we will be able to do. We are sticking to, you know, what, um, what voters um, want us to do. I, I think they, at the end of the day, they want us to govern. They want us to show that we are taking action on, on issues, um, that we are um, not afraid to move on, on those issues because we know that you know, in, improving the quality of life of, of Michigan residents, uh, we have we play a part in that. Policy is good politics. At, at the end of the day, we've been working on, and there's so many issues that we do need to work on that that we have broad support from from Michigan residents. I know I use the gun violence prevention bills as an example. I mean, everything that we've touched on uh, up to this point, we when you look at expanding the Civil Rights Act. Um, you know, supporting uh, worker freedom, um, the earned income working families tax credit, also known as EITC. But there's more to to build off of that. So the issues that we've really been we've really been tackling and will will continue to tackle are issues that are top of mind for for Michigan residents. When we come back, we will talk about the week that was in Michigan politics with our own Tim Skubik. We'll be right back. We had an unusual event in Lansing this past week, dueling press conferences as Democrats and Republicans squared off over a proposal to change criminal sentencing laws. Jordan Duran asked Capitol correspondent Tim Skubik to break it down for us. It's time to get updated politically here in the state of Michigan and nobody better than this guy right here, Tim Skubik, to get us the lowdown. Tim, we had dueling press conferences this week about a bill that would affect how long some criminals would spend behind bars. What's going on there? 
Yeah, this is a very controversial issue, and it, there are two distinct sides to this. The, the bill is called a productivity credit program for the prison system. Basically what it is is that it is an accelerated education program, job training program, to get inmates prepared to get out into the real world where they can be successful and not commit more crimes. Now, the supporters of this are saying this is just the right thing to do to prepare these people to return to society. Plus, we have a huge, huge problem of getting people to fill jobs and so this could be a pipeline to do that that's the people that support this on the other side law enforcement and some conservative Republican lawmakers who say wait a second Michigan has a law that says you must serve your minimum term whatever the judge gives you the minimum term has to be served before we can even have a discussion about you getting out of jail early and so you've got a philosophical debate over whether this is a, a violation of the state constitution or not. But you also have a debate over what's the right thing to do for prison inmates. Tim, we need a little history lesson from you. It was 50 years ago that a Michigan company mixed up its flame retardant and animal feed. What happened? And next, what lessons have we learned from what happened? Yeah, this is, this is an amazing story, and it's hard to believe that it was 50 years ago. All of us in this town that were residents of Michigan at the time woke up to the headlines that PBB, a very toxic chemical, was accidentally mixed in with cattle feed mm. and fed on over 500 farms wow. across the entire state of Michigan. Immediately, almost, the animals started to get sick, and as the animals got sick, some of this meat and some of the produce, it was chickens and uh, also cattle that were, uh, were affected, was sent to the marketplace. Mm. And you know what happened after that? Human beings went into the grocery shelf, bought the meat, brought it home, ate it, and voila! Wow. 8.5 million people in Michigan ate PBB. Wow. To my knowledge, we never had a study that did a direct linkage between PBB and a person's death. But it was a horrendous situation. Tim Jorma, thank you very much. If you are interested in getting more political news from Michigan and Washington, we've got just the thing for you. You can sign up for our Capital Rundown newsletter. It's just one email each week, and you can get it by pointing your cell phone camera at the screen right now. This will take you to the sign up page, or you can head to WLNS.com slash newsletter. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching the Capital Rundown.